Uh, for those of you just connecting, this is the Gala Think Interpreting Tech and Business Continuity webinar. And I will explain a little bit more about it in a moment, but I would like to turn the time over to Fardad Zabayan from Kudo, our host for the platform today. And he's going to explain a little bit about how the platform works, our regime for today's meeting, and... Um, and after that, we will just get started in earnest. So, Fardad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Alison. Uh, well, thank you for joining Gala first digital roundtable on, digit on interpreting technology. Um, when we first exploring, I think I reached out to Alison maybe very early in January or so, mid-January, about uh, there are possibilities of uh, hosting some of the sessions of Gala online and we were still hopeful of uh, being able to go to San Diego and meet over there and probably today was my flight back to San Francisco from San Diego um, but that didn't happen um, so um, before going to uh, review the features and functionality I just want to point out this painting behind me. Uh, my, my sister is an artist and uh, she lives in San Francisco. She's always worried. She's a single mom, always thinking about uh, what's next and so on. I switched this uh, frame um, about three weeks ago and put this new frame behind me. That's how I really feel. It's a lot of wonder and worries about what's next and so on. So, um, uh, and I'm sure this uh, uh, feeling applies uh, to many of us on this call today. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, uh, show you the uh, platform. Uh, this uh, session is available in six languages. For those who are uh, using the platform, I'm going to share my screen. Um, you're going to have the languages here. Go ahead and select your language. If you are one of the speakers or if you're going to ask a question, we really encourage you to speak the language that you feel more comfortable uh, or any of these languages. So go ahead and test, uh, experience the language interpretation. We have our interpreters. I'm going to mention their names towards the end. They're supporting us, making this meeting possible. Um, then you have this re request button here on the lower left side. That's when you request to speak. We're going to have a very active Q&A session thanks to your participation ahead of time. So you're going to uh, request to speak. There's going to be documents available throughout, uh, to, uh, throughout the meeting. Please go ahead and download if you want to keep a copy of this presentation. This is available for you. There is a message box. Glad to see that people are already using them. Um, and, uh, uh, but if uh, the messages become too many, we have a copy of them later. We can retract these messages and be able to answer them, provide them to Allison and Barry. They can provide the answers to you. Uh, there is a participant tab. There is a private tab. Private tab, if you want to say hello to your dear friend, a private message, or uh, making fun of, of any speakers, feel free to do that. No issue. Um, and uh, uh, there's going to be polling. So we're going to have uh, uh, items that here. We're going to uh, get you more engaged during this 90-minute uh, uh, webinar or roundtable. Uh, so there's going to be items that we're going to post here and uh, requires your participation. Could be yes, no, abstain. Could be multiple choice. The result going to be shown also on your own uh, screen as well as for future references. Um, one more thing is there are two tabs here, live presentation and uh, uh, live video and presentation. You can switch between seeing all the participants' video, whoever is speaking, or uh, seeing a thumbnail of the speaker on the lower part. Uh, Barry, anything uh, I missed? I think you have um, covered everything. And what might be helpful, Fardad, is if you were to include in the participant chat just a list of the languages that we're working with today. Um, and remind those of you, if you would like to speak in your native tongue, if it is one of those languages, please feel free to do so, as we have professional interpretation for the duration of this webinar. Barry, do you want to go ahead and uh, maybe uh, 
just start with a bit of Spanish so people they go into English if they want to follow it in English uh, just uh, to make sure that we all are comfortable with the language feature. I'm happy to do that. I will switch to Spanish now. Bueno, les doy la bienvenida a todos ustedes. Gracias por uh, acompañarnos durante esta hora y media. Tenemos mucha información que compartir y tenemos muchas preguntas también para ustedes. Um, para iniciar este webinario, ya que hemos aprendido cómo es que funciona esta plataforma y queremos agradecer a Fardad y el equipo de CUDO por habernos prestado a esta plataforma para esta reunión. Um, explico brevemente el hecho de que este webinario es el fruto de una colaboración ya de muchos años entre GALA, the Globalization and Localization Association, y Interpret América. Uh, lanzamos nuestra colaboración hace más de seis años, siete años, y um, Quisiera en este momento ceder la palabra a Alison Furch, quien es la directora ejecutiva de GALA. Ella va a hablar un poco acerca de GALA para que ustedes sepan. Um, quisiera mencionar algo. Recibimos más de 225 inscripciones hasta uh, las 9 de la mañana hoy. Y todavía hay otras personas que se están inscribiendo. Hemos logrado en este webinario lo que hemos tratado de lograr durante muchos años en distintas reuniones y conferencias. Este es un grupo sumamente heterogéneo. Tenemos representantes de empresas que usan nuestros servicios. Y estoy hablando de empresas grandes de todo el mundo. Tenemos representantes de compañías que proveen servicios de traducción e interpretación. Tenemos también diseñadores de tecnología. Y tenemos también muchos intérpretes y también capacitadores y profesores de interpretación. Entonces tenemos en esta colaboración representantes de la academia, de nuestra profesión, de la industria de los idiomas, y también los usuarios finales. En mi experiencia en más de una década de tratar de hacer esto, es la primera vez que hemos logrado esto de manera significativa. Entonces, hay una gran oportunidad aquí ante este desafío enorme que estamos viendo en todo el planeta. Tenemos la oportunidad de colaborar de, de una manera inédita. Y este es el primer paso. Entonces, dicho eso, quiero ceder la palabra a Alison, quien hablará acerca de Gala un poquito, y luego ella me va a ceder a mí la palabra. Entonces, Alison, te doy la palabra. Gracias, Barry. And I'm going to switch, um, well, I'm going to speak in English since that's my native language. And <clears throat> uh, this is really cool for me because this isn't a, a typical platform uh, for, for me. And so thanks, Barry, and thanks, Fardad. Um, bear with me for a moment while I um, queue up my, my slides for you. It's just about five of them. I will take very little time because the real uh, conversation is going to happen uh, after this. So let's try this again. Um, share screen. And this is really easy, everybody, for, for those of you who have a little bit of practice. Um, all right. And there we go. Let's make sure that you guys are seeing what I want you to see. Indeed. Okay. Um, so like Barry said, this is a cool opportunity. It's really a strange time, as we all know. Um, and what I want to do is just spend like two minutes sharing with you about the Gala community. Um, so Gala is a, it's a trade association or an industry association. Um, We're global, we have representation around the world, we're a nonprofit organization, and really what I, I think of us is a, it's a, a professional community, and like Barry said in his comments, it um, includes everybody in the community, all, all kinds of stakeholders from different walks. Um, 
We deliver programs, resources, and events. Many people are familiar with our marquee event, which is our annual conference. Um, we also have other smaller events uh, around the globe and um, throughout the year. Um, we have programs like our webinar series, a weekly webinar series, which um, we uh, record and archive. So we have many um, years worth of archived webinars as well. Um, resources such as a job board. Uh, I think Gala is also known for its networking and its sense of community, a, pro a professional community where people can learn from each other, um, support one another, um, you know, mentor, mentor one another. And um, our members, like I said, represent um, the diversity of stakeholders. We have language services and technologies comprising the bulk of our membership, about 70% of it. Um, we have what I call stewards of global brands and globalization gurus. Um, that might mean for many of you uh, what is often referred to as direct clients. So companies that are doing global business and are well-known global brands that are operating um, multinationally. Um, so we've got uh, also academics, um, professors, students, um, uh, technology companies. So the full range of stakeholders. Everybody, uh, we're spread out obviously heavily in Europe and North America, but um, in other parts of the world as well. Um, we recently made a membership free for any academic institution that's offering training programs in translation, interpretation, localization, and, and related disciplines. If that's you and this is news to you, get in touch with me. We'd love to welcome you and, and make our resources freely available to the uh, instructors, professors, students, um, everybody. Uh, we're a community. I hope I, I'm making that clear. I hope you feel that on this call. Um, we are primarily focused on sharing information, knowledge, um, examining trends, understanding best practices. Uh, we like to say that we're future-oriented and human-focused, so we don't, um, we look to technology as a solution, but not to replace people, so we're very human-centered, and we keep our focus on that um, even as we explore technologies. And uh, the association itself is meant to provide this cooperative link between individuals, ultimately, and the organizations that they work for, um, and our association. So these are some of the things that, uh, that come with Gala membership. It is a membership organization. It's open to companies at the moment. We don't have individual memberships at the moment. Um, and uh, these are just some of the, the, the benefits. So um, originally, this was meant to be a roundtable discussion at the Gala conference in San Diego on the pre-conference day. And the purpose of it was to bring together stakeholders to talk about the future of interpreting and interpreting technologies at Gala. Like Barry said, we've had this partnership with Interpret America for several years. And it's time to make it part of Gala's DNA. Uh, traditionally, Gala has been focused more on the written word rather than the spoken word, and uh, that's changing. So um, we want to get back to this topic, and we may pick up on it a little bit today, but it will be addressed in the future, and we would love your input then. So um, that's it from me about Gala. You're welcome to reach out to me anytime. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention one thing. Um, those of you um, may have seen it yesterday or have uh, just observed it yourself, but I want to make a sort of an acknowledgement and apology for the manner in which um, you were invited to this. It, it, everything about this situation is, is extraordinary, right? The topic, the times, the platform, the people, the agenda. It, it's all different, um, the communication. And so, uh, yes, your emails were exposed to one another. Um, and Gala does take GDPR very seriously. We take privacy very seriously. This is really kind of an outlier situation. So my apologies for that and my request to all of you to please be sort of mindful and respectful of that. So um, without further ado, I'm going to um, turn it back to Barry and we'll continue on. So thanks very much and I look forward to working with you. Awesome, Allison. Thank you so much. You can go ahead and end the share on your screen and I'll release your mic and Catherine if you can go ahead and request the mic I'm gonna pull your video up as well so as soon as you've done that I'll have you come up perfect so um, with me now is uh, co-president and my business partner Catherine Allen of Interpret America and at this time we just quickly want to share a couple of things with you to try and frame our discussion just a little bit 
And to do that, um, Catherine, I don't know if you want to say a, a couple of words as, before I dive into the slides. I just want to say hi to everybody and thank you so much for attending in what has turned into a very different event than originally envisioned. Um, and it's really gratifying to see everybody online and I'm really hoping this is an indicator that we may be able to get the kind of visibility and um, oomph we need to really help people get connected multilingually on these platforms, especially now that it's the only way to connect. So thanks everyone for being here. All right, thanks, Catherine. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, screen here quickly. And uh, all of you should be able to see my slides. <clears throat> so welcome to this event. Let me just begin by saying that this is a collaboration, as I mentioned, of Interpret America and Gala. I think interpreting is now in its seventh year. And um, since this is part of the conference that was scheduled for this week in San Diego, we've basically taken this piece of the conference, it's morphed a little bit, and we've moved it to the cloud. And so I want to say thank you to our sponsors because without them, we would not be able to do the work that we have done over the last seven years in order to really strengthen interpreting from within the language services industry. So CLI, Certified Languages International, thank you for supporting us all the way. Um, you've been there and we're just so glad to see that you're here with us today online. Um, let me also uh, do a quick shout out to three of our, our um, exhibitors who would have been exhibiting in San Diego, Boost Lingo, Interpreter Intelligence, and Presence Translate and Interact. Boost Lingo and Interpreter Intelligence are based in the Bay Area in California, so they're hunkered down at the moment with a shelter in place. And Presence is based in Luxembourg and has offices in other parts of Europe. So thanks to all of you, and I look forward to hearing from uh, Boost Lingo a little bit later today. Okay. So, um, and then finally, we've already said thank you, Kudo. Thanks for making this possible and in multiple languages as well. This is uh, truly a great thing that's happening. So, having said that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and we are going to get down to some polling. Um, we have five questions that we want to ask all of the participants to try and give you an idea of where people are connecting from and who's on this call. Um, I've mentioned that in the registration, but we want to take a look at who's actually on the call. And so Pablo, what I would like you to do is start the poll and if you would launch question number one, please. So for those of you on your screen, what you'll need to do is click on the polls button and we're asking where are you connecting from? That's the first question. And so please, uh, you'll click on that question and the options will appear of where you're connecting from. And then you can submit your answer. And I will give you guys just a minute to do that as you're trying to find these questions. Um, and then we're going to take a look at the results so that you can see what the spread is uh, geographically around the globe. Um, as you were doing this, let me just mention that as we have discussed this meeting and we've organized it, we've said, okay, what are we dealing with? And I don't want to fall into hyperbole, but I do think that we have not seen an event with this magnitude and reach affecting the world since World War II. Now, obviously, we're not at war. Thank heaven, we are not at war. But we are definitely seeing global effects of the pandemic, and it is affecting the economy uh, amazingly, and it has had an extreme effect on our profession very quickly. So something to think about. Um, Pablo, if we've had a good chunk of our participants participate in the poll, you can go ahead and close the poll and then show us the poll results. And I'm sure Pablo is working on doing a couple of clicks to make that happen. And we should be able to see those very shortly. There we go. So as you can see, we have most from North America and Europe, but we do have some folks in Asia. Wow, it must be really early in the morning. Thanks for joining. Um, and we do have some others attending from South America as well. Excellent. Let's run question number two now, Pablo. So if you go back to the polls tab. and activate question number two. 
so with this one, um, you are a, an interpreter, a language service company representative, end user, academic trainer, or other, and you may select multiple on this one. You don't have to select just one. So please go ahead and fill that out. Give you a chance to uh, answer that question. And we wanted to find out this because one of the big challenges of most industry events is to get a good cross-section of all of the stakeholders in the same place at the same time. You often at industry events, you get a lot of providers. At professional events, you get a lot of practitioners. And what we don't have are end users quite as much. So it'll be interesting to see how our poll results turn out for our second question regarding uh, what is your stakeholder role in this. So Pablo, when you see that we have um, a significant response rate, I would say at least over 100, feel free to close that poll out and let's take a look at the results. And as we're waiting for these results, let me just mention to all of you is one of the hurdles that we find as a profession, as an industry, um, is the ability to be able to reach out to potential end users and to get our story out there. And so that's a big part of what we want to talk about today. Here again, as we look at this, we have a lot of interpreters. We have a few more language service company reps. We have 11 end users. We have a lot of academics on as well, and then other um, I wish we had been able to include a please explain, but that wasn't possible. So you can see where we are here today. We, we do have a pretty good mix. So uh, let's go ahead and start poll question number three. And Pablo, thank you so much for putting that up. For this one, what inter interpreting services do you provide? So we can get a sense of what you offer. Uh, if you are an LSC, you can indicate that. Um, if you are an individual interpreter, again, you can select more than one if you work across um, modalities and uh, settings. So I'll give you a minute or two, or a few more seconds to go ahead and fill that uh, poll question out. And again, Pablo, when you feel like we've hit probably around 120, 130 or so, uh, feel free to close the poll and publish the results. And as you are filling that out and we're waiting for the results of the third question, I'll just mention I'm happy to say that we are on schedule and things are progressing nicely. We're planning on having a 90-minute meeting. Here we go. What services are provided? We've got a lot of people working in the conference area, um, a good chunk in healthcare, legal as well, community and public service. And I think it's safe to say that we have um, many people that are working in the different uh, areas of interpreting across the board and diversification is only going to become more important as we move through this crisis right so Pablo if you'd like to go ahead and launch the next question there we go since the outbreak began how many cancellations have you had this is an important one so we can take the temperature of of what's happened. I think it's probably going to be pretty high um, across the board. Um, the question that we will do after this, and it will be our last question for this segment, is going to be in monetary terms. But for right now, it's just how many jobs, whether they've lasted three days or they were two hours, how many cancellations have you had since the pandemic uh, began to have an effect on our profession? And this is for practitioners as well as for language service providers, language service companies. And Pablo, again, just when you've got uh, a good uh, sample of the group, please go ahead and close the poll and publish those results. Um, this is an area, and I'll, I'll mention this as, as you're working through the polls and we're waiting for those to be um, 
publish this last question. Um, what we have seen in general, having spoken with a number of language service companies and also with individual um, interpreters, practitioners, is that there was this huge wave of cancellations. And we have been in a situation where there have been, it's a holding pattern, where now the end user is trying to figure out what can we do? What is feasible? What are the options? And we're still, to a certain extent, in that moment. But we are now moving into the moment where they're starting to take action and we're seeing things move online. As you can see, we've got um, quite a few that have had one to five cancellations. I think this is indicative of the fact that many jobs are short. Uh, they have a very short lead time. And so there weren't as many um, uh, bookings for a lot of the individuals and also for the companies. But as you can see, this is quite substantial. We are in 21 or more, which is in second place with one to five at 36. Last question that we're going to do on this segment has to do with monetary terms. And again, I know you're going to have to ballpark this a little bit, but uh, I know I'll be able to say exactly how much money I've lost as a result of these cancellations. Um, so if you click on the question under polls, you can decide in monetary terms how much of a loss in revenue have, and it's, the question is truncated, but have, has your company or your own business uh, incurred because of the pandemic? And this is in dollars. Um, I know that those of you who are in Europe will have to do a quick calculation in your head and add a little bit more to it as the euro is still, I think, about eight or nine cents uh, ahead of the dollar. Um, for those of you in other currencies, hopefully you'll be able to adjust also quickly to a dollar value. And uh, Fardad, just a quick question, um, and you don't have to answer right now, but um, can we make sure that this polling data is uh, saved and we can make it available to attendees? Um, I think it would be useful for them to have um, as we are trying to you know, see what has happened um, since the pandemic. All right, Pablo, hopefully we are close and you can close out. Here we go. Great. So um, largely we've got, since we do have individual practitioners, uh, about half of the attendees today, as you can tell, what we are looking at is um, a very similar, um, what we're seeing is that most of it is in the, um, you know, $1,000 to $25,000 range. Um, but we do have some that are actually quite high. As you can see, there are some organizers and LSCs that have seen losses in the millions of dollars. Um, so this is not an insignificant um, event, as we all know. So we're going to set these polls aside at this time, and I hope that this was a useful exercise for you. It was very much for me. And uh, next on our agenda is for us to go through a framing uh, presentation that I am going to give. Catherine will be chiming in if she has anything to add because if I miss something, she will be quick to um, come in and compliment. So I'm going to share my screen again and we will get back to our next slide. Here we go. So the question is, now that we've established, obviously, that there has been serious damage dealt to individual practitioners and the industry as a whole, uh, the big question is, where do we go from here? Um, so many people are asking this question. I'm going to try and give you some information and help to frame our discussion um, here in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to be moving on and hearing from people to give us some reports from the field. So um, I wanted to say that the most important thing after our health and ensuring that, that we are safe and that we flatten the curve and we're doing the things that we've been asked to do is to recognize that as an industry and as a profession, I think the most important imperative is to continue the use of interpreting, to make it available in the ways that hospitals, courts, governments, businesses, entities, international organizations are going to be communicating over the next few months. 
for however long this is going to last. Because if we don't ensure that continuity, we are going to be even in a more difficult position once this pandemic subsides. Quickly, what are we talking about? I just want to frame this because we have such a heterogeneous group. We're talking about different types of remote interpreting. You have over-the-phone interpreting, which is the behemoth in all reality and has been for some time in terms of private sector work and also for uh, community and public service interpreting. Video remote interpreting, which is with the video component, but generally consecutive and used in healthcare, schools, um, public service interpreting, uh, not a great deal in the conference realm. And then you have remote simultaneous interpretation, which is what we are experiencing today on this platform. Um, and this is one flavor. This is a meeting that is entirely distributed. Nobody is meeting face-to-face -face physically at a conference center. But there are many types and flavors of RSI. But this is the one that we are going to see more and more. Distributed meetings online with simultaneous interpretation. Now next, um, this is where we're focusing our attention today, change or expand service delivery. Um, there are other areas where technology is having a significant influence on what we do, but this is where we're going to focus our attention. I do want to quickly say about replacing or um, complementing the use of human interpretation. We are now seeing AI applications that are quite uh, useful in certain circumstances. Nothing that's going to be replacing per se um, professional services when those are needed, but it is beginning to augment in a number of different places. This will be a topic for an entirely different webinar at another time, but I do want to flag that because AI is here and it does have applications that are being used now and it's only going to grow. So the question is what can you do? I've broken this down into four groups, and I'm going to try to get through these um, as quickly as I can so that we can get to hear from the field reports. I want to start with language service companies. You're all asking, what do we do now? Many of you probably have had a very robust face-to-face -face interpreting um, uh, vertical for some time or, or, or um, business flow, and now it's all dried up and you're saying, what do I do? How do I keep my business afloat? Here are a number of items that I would suggest, and I would remind you all that these are in the uh, documents, so you'll be able to download these for reading them later. But you need to take a look at your current operations and assess where there is a possibility for those operations to move online for your end clients, because that is where you're going to find your greatest opportunity. And then you need to reach out to those clients, talk to them about transitioning from their current form of interpreting provision to some form of remote, whether it be OPI, VRI, or SRI, or excuse me, RSI. If you don't have an in-house solution, right, many of you may be saying, well, I don't have the tech to do this, I don't have it, I haven't focused on it in the past. What you should do is think about finding white labeling, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. White labeling, if you have not heard that term before, means that you are able to partner with an other organization and then use the infrastructure they have created and then you are able to put your own label on it so that it is branded for your company. Um, this is going to be key, I think, for a lot of agencies if they are hoping to weather this storm, that they will need to be able to offer these services to their existing clients as they transition to online and distributed operations as well. Um, help your interpreters make the switch by providing guidance and best practices. Many of them have not done remote before either. Frankly, we have dragged our feet far too long on this. And we're at a point now where all of the other work that we preferred to do isn't there anymore. And so people need to feed families. People need to move forward and make it through this rough patch. So and working there, with the I, is going to help. I wanted to jump in just for a second and kind of give that broader frame that the majority of interpreting is on site. You know, remote interpreting for the most part, right? You are going to get to that. But just the, idea, the understanding that, at least in the U.S. and in most parts of Europe, we are all have been on-site interpreters, and so getting this switch over is actually a very big, heavy lift. Yeah, it is indeed. Um, and one of the other issues that you should think about as an agency is not only with your clients, but how do you get the word out about remote being a viable option 
during the pandemic and during the social distancing that's going to be required as it moves through different countries. Um, because people need to know what's out there. That's been one of the biggest challenges that any remote interpreting provider has actually had. Consider collaborating with other companies and with technology providers. You may need to pool resources. You may need to find complementary relationships with other companies to be able to make it through this. Now, this is one that I'm going to repeat over and over again. Standards matter, but they must be relaxed during the emergency and then they need to be put back in place as soon as feasible, as soon as possible. One example of this is all of you in the United States are familiar with HIPAA requirements for uh, confidentiality. Um, it in is healthcare a, settings. In, in healthcare settings. And it is now a situation where the HIPAA standards for um, audio and video connections has actually been um, put in relaxed. a bit for the time being, it's been relaxed so that people can provide services remotely without having uh, to be HIPAA compliant. This is an example of how the standards are going to have to be relaxed because of the need that is out there. Those that are HIPAA compliant, great opportunity for you to differentiate yourself. But these standards are going to have to be relaxed if we're going to make this move because the practitioners aren't going to have everything that is needed immediately to be able to provide the service and be 100% in compliance with best practices that have been out there. This is a hard pill to swallow, but it's, it's, it's reality. Individual interpreters. You're going to have to equip yourself to work from home. Um, most of the RSI stuff had been well, we're going to work from hubs, and hubs were being set up. But the fact of the matter is there are probably about a dozen hubs, if that, around the world. Um, those would be very quickly overwhelmed. And now many of those hubs cannot even be used because of the social distancing measures that have been mandated in certain places. And so they will have to work from home. Again, it gets to the idea of standards are important, but they're going to have to be relaxed for a certain amount of time. Um, Interpreters, you've got to equip yourselves to know how to work from home. Um, this is an entire other webinar that can be given and is going to need to be given m many times over. Quality headset, broadband connection, a quiet place where you can work without interruption, if that's possible when the entire family's home now. Um, you need to get on board with different providers of RSI, OPI, and, and VRI, right? Because you need to show them that you are wanting this work and that you're qualified to work here. I will say that many of the providers right now are overwhelmed with onboarding. And so this is where other agencies that may not have a whole lot of work at the moment could partner with some of these bigger uh, providers and say, well, we can help you with the onboarding to try to get people on. You can get your people trained on how to do it and help people on board so they know how to do this. It's a huge issue because we're already seeing the remote providers being overwhelmed. I mean, they're, they're working 12, 14, 15 hour days to try and, and keep up with the inquiries and demand as it's growing. Diversify, diversify, diversify. Get the word out about remote as a possible solution. Talk to your clients. Let them know. And again, standards matter, but we're going to have to do some relaxing for a time. And for individual interpreters, what well, that means is people are going to maybe someone in my case who doesn't have a perfect internet connection and I may be connecting, <laughs> yeah. you know, if I need it. So I th that's what I think it means in terms of individual interpreters relaxing yeah, let, some of the standards. Let, yeah, let me just say that, that your connection proved that that's the case. <laughs> Yeah, just right so, now. No, sorry about that. <laughs> so there will be those situations yeah. where our, our internet connectivity is a big question mark right now um, as more and more people move online. So end users of interpreting. Quickly, get informed about the virtual meeting and remote interpreting options that are out there. Contact folks. Reach out and learn. Educate yourself so you know what the options are to cover the needs that you have. Access your current communication needs and determine where remote interpreting can help. Um, and or it is absolutely imperative. English only really is not an inclusive strategy. So please, um, it cuts so many people out of the conversation. It is not where we need to be as a global society. So I highly 
um, encourage you to find solutions rather than just saying, oh, we'll just have English do it because it's going to reduce who actually has access to services, who's able to get uh, help in a pandemic. There are just so many issues with that. Now get the word out about remote as a viable option. Again, as a pandemic for you guys as well, and the same thing about standards. And now finally, as the wait for the slide just to switch, interpreter trainers and educators, you need to simplify. You're all going to have to go back or you're teaching now online um, and having very little lead time to be able to do this. So explore the options that are out there. None of them are perfect. Don't wait for the perfect solution. You can't. Help your students adapt. Many of them are freaking out about how they're going to do this. Um, help them adapt, and it's not what any of us signed up for, but we have to deal with it. And get the word out about remote as a viable option here again, and standards matter. So those are the things that I would offer up um, in general for each group. Now, I'm going to talk specifics here for a minute. Normally, in these kinds of webinars, I don't do this because if you mention one, you obviously should mention all, or there's one that you haven't heard of. And what I'm mentioning here today is what I know. There are more options out there in terms of technologies and platforms. I would encourage you on the chat stream to mention others that you know of, that you're aware of, that work well, that you've worked with. Um, this is by no means an inclusive list. I'm giving principles and then some examples. And I've g weighted it towards those who attend GALA and are members of GALA because this is a GALA event. And this is how it would have gone on um, at the event as well. So for over the phone and video remote interpreting, I'm going to mush those two together because one basically is slowly displacing the other. And I repeat slowly. Um, OPI over the phone is the behemoth. It is what people are using. If you need to white label, if you need to find a way for you to begin offering these services, there are many companies out there. I've mentioned those that are here. This is in alphabetical order. I'm not trying to highlight one over another. Uh, Boostlingo provides this service. They have both OPI and VRI infrastructure for companies that are looking to add um, these services to their portfolio and they make it possible for you to brand it and everything else. Certified Languages International, our sponsor, also does white labeling and makes it so that people can have branded um, OPI and VRI solutions. Um, Interpreter Intelligence, who I believe is also on this call as well, um, they have um, and they're a good example of transitioning and moving quickly because they have a very large business for agencies that need to run their back office and their scheduling from end to end for all of the on-site appointments for um, medical and whatnot. So what we have here is an opportunity to for them to transition. They had the VRI component before, but I don't think it was their largest, and they can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But they are now working hard to transition their clients and say, you can now move to VRI. You can now look at these other options. So you've got to adapt quickly. Okay. So most providers for um, community and PSI public service interpreting are national because of legislation, because of requirements. And so if you're connecting from another country, not the United States or Canada, um, you need to look at what's available in your country. In Europe, the Nordics really are the most advanced and have built out the most infrastructure for VRI um, and OPI. There are others in other countries and in Germany and in the UK and whatnot. I don't want to get into the whole issue of rates and all the other concerns that are surrounding all of this. All of that matters. Let me just simply say to the providers and to the, the um, language service companies, we've got to find a way to make sure that everybody's happy um, and people are not going to want to do this if they can't make a living at it. And so we've got to find that happy medium, trying to find those right price points to keep everybody on the chain happy is a real challenge, but it's something that we have to do. So these are some options. There are many others out there, but um, this just gives you an example of how you can white label. This is a place for you to start. Um, when I get to remote simultaneous interpreting, you're going to see that there are a lot of other options here. And there are many different flavors of remote simultaneous interpreting. There are many companies that have gone belly up in the last five years. They started and flashed out. 
Um, I will tell you that all of the ones here are still available today. And um, Oxala, which is at the top of the list, again, this is alphabetical, they have an option to be able to connect a um, audio stream, an alternative audio stream or streams through um, smart devices for people that are working on platforms that are mainstream and do not offer um, multiple audio channels like Kudo does and, and others. So if you need to mash up WebEx, you can put it with Oxala and have the ability to be able to interpret. It takes some work um, by your technical people, but it's possible. Um, the others that are here, Catalava is based in Greece. Interactio is based in the, the uh, Baltics. Um, you'll notice that I've put uh, asterisks by four companies. Uh, the reason I've done this is that I know these companies quite well. They have been around for some time and they have staffed very, very large events in different ways. And they are basically, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, they are now the industry leaders in this area. Um, there are others like all you say out of Spain, Speakus, um, that you can also look at. These are both based in Europe, but Interprefy, Kudo, Voiceboxer, and ZipDX in their domains are the leaders. Um, and finally, I've tacked zoom.us on here because Zoom, of course, is it seems to be eating the video conferencing world. And they did introduce a uh, remote simultaneous feature in October. Um, I will tell you that it is truncated and not fully developed and problematic for a number of reasons because it has not been designed fully to be able to handle team interpreting or relay or matters like that. Um, it can work for like a very short something with one interpreter. There's no way to switch interpreters. It's, 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 it's not complete. That's how I'll leave it. Um, but I do think it's important to note that at least one of the mainstream platforms has recognized that interpreting and multilingual is a thing. And so that in itself is important. Um, working with a lot of these, uh, many of them have white labeling options. You can work with them to be able to hold these meetings immediately. They have staff. Um, some of them only provide the infrastructure like ZipDX. Um, like um, Oxala, um, but others provide full suite services. They'll provide the interpreters, all of the support, and the platform, like Kudo Today, Interprefy, or Voiceboxer. Um, I believe that's the case with All You Say and some of the others here as well, but I'll leave it at that. Hopefully this information proves helpful to you. So we are at a time. It is going to be a bumpy road along the way. Now is the time of implementation. It's not time to sit back and say, oh, it's not quite there yet. No, we have to act because if we don't, we're actually going to be left behind. And that is one of my biggest concerns because without a doubt, as interpreting moves online, people are going to say, oh, this works for me for a number of reasons. It's more convenient. People don't have to travel. I'm not going to have to pay travel time. A lot of these other issues are going to come into it. And once now, um, the genie's out of the bottle, or as they s said when I was growing up on the farm, once the cow's out of the barn, she's not going back in. Uh, and so, although things will get back to some kind of normal, we should understand that VRI, all of these remote services, are going to have a bigger percentage in the market than they did before the pandemic, um, particularly the case for um, signed language interpreting, which I'm only mentioning now. So if we have any sign language interpreters on, forgive me for not mentioning it at the outset. But sign language interpreting is going to see this phenomenon, I think, quite notably. End up with just a couple of quotes, and then we're going to move to our, our first people. And Kristen Quinlan, you're going to be up first. So if you want to go ahead and request the mic. This is from Klaus Schwab. Oh, how prophetic he was when he said this years back. Change will not come in waves this time, like in the past. It is coming as a tsunami whose effect will be felt everywhere. And may I add, like a tsunami, just immediately. We're going to have to show agility and entrepreneurship to survive the changes coming because it will change everything, and it now has. So we've got to figure out how we're going to adapt. 
And then finally, I've got to mention Bill Wood because this is a quote that has uh, been with us for at least a decade now since Bill said it at the second Interpret America conference in D.C. Interpreters will not be replaced by technology. They will be replaced by interpreters who use technology. And now we are seeing that because it's the only way that we're going to be able to get work uh, for the most part for um, the next few months. So having said that, I'm going to stop the slide share and... Uh, We'll go back to our video and let me see if I've got, do, 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 bear with me one moment. I've got to get to my right tab. There's Kristen. I'm going to accept this. What we're going to be doing now, and um, Catherine, if you'd like, um, yeah, we'll have you drop off perfect. So we've got Kristen. You can turn on your video and your audio. We are going to hear from uh, several people who are actually on the front lines right now. Kristen Quinlan is the CEO of Certified Languages International. It's one of the largest VRI OPI providers in the United States. And Kristen is a true friend of the profession. Um, and I've asked them to answer three questions. I'm going to give them five minutes each, and I'm going to be a real stickler on the time. So, um, Kristen, I'm going to turn the time over to you. I've asked you to just kind of explain boots on the ground what's going on and with the questions that I seated you with, but the five minutes are yours. Okay, thanks. First of all, Barry and Catherine, I can't thank you enough for putting all of us together to talk about this. It is a super scary time and nobody really knows what to do. So pulling this together and having us all be able to communicate and share and kind of understand that we're all in this together is 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 super important. So um, racing to talk about what Certified Languages does. We are a remote interpreting company. We provide exclusively OPI and VRI services. Um, we uh, service between 20 and 30,000 calls a day in 232 languages. We are really, really lucky that we, our platform already exists, that all of our interpreters are remote agents. Um, most of them are working from home in the United States. We cover 232 languages. Um, we have about uh, thirty percent of our Spanish calls are handled by uh, partners located in South America and Central America. We're having some glitches there because um, in some of those countries the government has shut down all commerce. Um, but we're dealing with that. So the biggest um, issue we backing up, our services are mission critical. Well, about sixty to sixty five percent of the business we do is in the hospital and healthcare industry. And as we all know, that is just booming right now and um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that every single one of those calls is handled seamlessly. Um, our biggest deal is how do we ensure seamless continuity when all of our calls are bridged through a call center with warm live body agents working in one of our two call centers and they all have to be moved home in a matter of days. Um, so we mobilized, we um, purchased 100 computers that were here overnight. <laughs> we're starting to migrate them home and it has been fairly seamless, um, but it has been daunting. So we literally have worked around the clock. We had to source um, a virtual remote cloud-based de desktop web browser in order to give them um, access. It's deployed via URL that will allow our agents to access our phone system so that they can seamlessly take calls. Um, that was done in um, a matter of 24 hours. We've had to train backup agents who might be working in an administrative setting here at, at CLI to, to be able to take calls. Um, so far, we have had, um, I think, two instances of a backed up queue, and the backed up queue is maybe a wait of 45 seconds. So we're doing really, really well. We're also migrating all of our administration and exec people um, to a work from home model. Um, but it's been, it's been terrifying, um, but we're doing it. Um, some of the issues we're facing um, that you asked us to address is um, basic bandwidth. Um, with everybody in America and elsewhere moving to a home-based solution, um, the internet gets sucked up, especially when you have high-density um, areas. So with that, we've got um, hotspots that we've deployed um, to those who are having any internet connectivity issues, and that's worked really well. Um, we have communicated with um, our existing clients as well as any prospects that we are open and we are available. Um, we also are communicating with our partners that are that do face-to-face -face and on-site interpreting that we can be their backup. Um, we have a very robust um, white label service. Two minutes. 
oh gosh, I can go on and on. Um, we have a very robust white label service that is uh, it's about 20% of our business as we put companies who do on-site interpreting into business. Um, it's, um, it's branded by your company. So anybody who needs to move their services to either VRI or OPI um, are able to do so. A couple of case, um, cases that we're working on right now, the federal government contacted Walmart, we're the, we're the um, provider of all um, interpreting services for every Walmart uh, pharmacy and health clinic in the nation. Um, the White House contacted them this week to ask them to set up mobile clinics in the parking lots around the country. That's going to begin on, um, on Friday. Um, how do you do remote interpreting in a parking lot with agents that are wearing masks and shields? So it's been a really interesting lesson in working with them and trying to figure out how we help them communicate with these clients. So we're using cell phones and we're using, but to educating this whole new populace. We're setting up call centers that are specific for hospitals to service this pandemic COVID-19 hotlines. And that's been a whole new source of business. We've got several huge national hospitals um, reaching out to us saying, we got to set up a call center, we need a proprietary line, how do we do this? We've got glossaries of terminologies that we've developed to uh, to deploy to our interpreters that are all around this this COVID-19. It is a um, an exciting time, it's a scary time, but we are very, very blessed to be in the area that we are in remote interpreting. We know how to do this, this is what we do for a living, and we would love to help others try to navigate. Um, we have the ability to put interpreters on our platform from other agencies so we we're really mobile um, so reach out to us if we can help you we're here trying to solve the problem on uh, primarily a healthcare um, basis right now for our for our clients um, and um, business will get back to normal one day but I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a long road before we get there um, anyway. okay excellent um, thank you so much for that I really appreciate it and I've got to turn off my alarm now there we go. Oh, Carol, um, we're, we're, Kristen, thank you so much. Um, and we may have some questions for you a little bit later. You can sure. go ahead and release the mic. Uh, Carol Wagner from Rotary International. Carol, we're going to have you go next. I know that you've got to get onto another call, and we really want to hear from you before you have to, you have to leave us. So, Carol, I'm going to give you the floor and turn on your mic. And this is Carol Wagner from Rotary International, uh, based in Illinois. Rotary is a very large organization, service organization that uses interpreting services regularly. Um, so Carol, I'm going to turn the time right over to you. Five minutes. So hello, everyone. I'm going to switch to Portuguese. This is my native language. I'm going to speak Portuguese right now. So um, here Rotary right now, we are aqui no Rotary, nós <laughs> Nós estamos todos trabalhando de casa, é, então o que, que acontece? Uh, isso nunca aconteceu de, de, de parar todo mundo e a gente ter que trabalhar de casa. Então é, a organização está incentivando todos a usar é, Zoom, Skype, qualquer uma plataforma e continuar as suas reuniões da mesma maneira. É, acontece que o Rotary é uma organização que é internacional. E nós trabalhamos com interpretação o ano inteiro, é, fornecendo um, a interpretação para todas as nossas comissões, as nossas reuniões de conselho diretor. É, e está sendo muito difícil, porque todas as reuniões estão sendo canceladas. É, o mês de março e o mês de abril são os nossos meses uh, uh, de maiores reuniões. Então, nós temos interpretações sometimes, às vezes, em 13 idiomas é, aqui. É, é, nós temos um, é, intérpretes que estão in-house, nós temos intérpretes uma, que a gente tem que contratar como freelancers, isso está impactando a todos, inclusive a organização. É, é, quais os recursos que nós não temos agora, que está aqui na organização, é que a gente está agora nos adaptando a tecnologias que incorporam a interpretação. É, há dois anos uh, eu conheci é, o Fardad e a equipe dele e que eles nos apresentaram o Curo. É, desde, o, desde então nós estamos é, usando e, e é fenomenal. É, agora a gente pode, através dessas tecnologias, é, fornecer é, interpretação simultânea para os nossos constituintes. Então, o que, que acontece? Quando nós uh, usamos o Zoom ou uh, uh, o Skype, que são all over the phone, 
que a gente usava mais, não é ideal para o intérprete, não era ideal para os nossos constituintes. E agora nós estamos usando tecnologias que incorporam a interpretação simultânea. Então, as corporações como Rotary, nós também estamos procurando tecnologias que vão nos ajudar a fornecer reuniões e que vão ajudar os nossos constituintes a participarem efetivamente de todas as reuniões nos seus idiomas. Um, para isso, é, por exemplo, às vezes eu tenho dificuldade de encontrar intérpretes agora, por exemplo, que estão é, treinados em usar esse tipo de tecnologia. Tá? Os nossos intérpretes foram treinados, eu não tenho a capacidade in-house é, de fornecer interpretação para todas as minhas reuniões, então eu tenho que procurar fora no mercado. Nem todos os intérpretes sabem esse tipo de tecnologia. E se eu preciso de uma coisa last minute? Dois minutos. Dois minutos. É, se eu preciso de uma coisa é, rápida para amanhã, por exemplo, eu tenho dificuldade em contar intérpretes que é, podem fornecer. Sem, por exemplo, eu ter que contatar a empresa e falar com eles, ah, você pode treinar o meu intérprete. É, é, é complicado. Então, o que, eu, o que eu acho que deve acontecer, sim, como você disse no seu slides, são os intérpretes também se adaptarem, tanto quanto nós, empresas, estamos nos adaptando a tempos difíceis uh, como agora. É, ontem, por exemplo, uh, nós tivemos uma, é, um, um board meeting grande com a participação de 19 é, membros do nosso conselho diretor em idiomas, nós usamos o Curo, é, pela primeira vez com o conselho diretor, foi excelente, os intérpretes foram treinados, é, então, é, o que eu quero dizer a todo mundo que está nessa, 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 nessa conferência é que em tempos difícil, difíceis nós precisamos nos adaptar, e agora né, nós temos a tecnologia, nós temos os recursos, é, e que é, nós só precisamos ser treinados, é, e, e, e o in-person nunca vai acabar, nós precisamos dos intérpretes, nós precisamos é, de, de incorporar é, o idioma nos nossos, em todas as nossas reuniões. Uh, and I hope this was good. Muito obrigado. Thank muito you obrigado, all. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much, Carol. And uh, I think the, the two things I, I take away from what you've mentioned, at least for individual practitioners, is get trained, get online, and be available. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Carol, thanks so much. You can go ahead Thank and just you click all. on the release mic. Thank you all. This was wonderful. Good luck sure. with, the, with the next meeting. I really Thank appreciate you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And so after being able to hear from uh, Carol, Cyril, if you'd like to uh, request the floor, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you in, and I'll introduce Cyril here. Um, those of you who are conference interpreters in Europe probably uh, have had a chance to meet or maybe even work with Cyril. Cyril Belange is based in Nice, if I remember correctly, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, and um, active on social media, uh, interested in technology. And so I thought I would reach out to him and give him a chance to let us know what it's like for an individual interpreter, conference interpreter, who suddenly has seen his appointment book uh, be empty and how he's working to approach that and answer those same questions. So Cyril, time's yours, five minutes. Thank you. First of all, uh, my deepest thanks to Professor Olsen for having me on this prestigious roundtable. I'm really truly honored. Thank you also to the gala organizers, uh, Alison Furch and also Interpret America, Catherine High, could away for setting up these remarkable meetings on such uh, such short notice. Special thanks also to Julia Poger for uh, ongoing support. I, I'll dive in now. Uh, so I decided to answer to the questions uh, Professor Olson asked me directly. So what do I need to ensure business continuity over the next three months? Well, my answer is pretty straightforward. I need the proper tools, and by this I mean the remote simultaneous interpreting platform to deliver top-notch performances for my clients. I already have a team of conference interpreters with some experience in remote interpreting. They operate in the most demanding language pairs in my South of France private market. Nevertheless, I urgently need the adequate platform to deliver these services. I also have a remote interpreting studio in the making, located in the center of Nice, France, but due to the current crisis, of course, we cannot use it. Consequently, 
I will need to know how to deliver quality remote interpreting from our, our home office for, for the time being, right? So my urgent request, uh, a remote interpreting platform okay to play ball with me and be the tech provider I need. I don't need another competitor here. Plus, I need affordable rates when I order a package solution to this interpreting platform to make it work for me, for my clients. I'm not with the UN, I don't have deep pockets as they have. And by the way, I'm not the only one. There are dozens of small consultant interpreters like me eager to buy this type of services. So I need to take solutions, uh, take solutions, sorry, because my clients are happy with my services and I don't think they will accept to change interpreters just because of this temporary, hopefully, lockdown or the emergence of disruptive online communications. I'm looking for specific resources to do this. I need to improve the digital skill set of my interpreters so they can navigate easily from one video conference platform to another and share their knowledge with the rest of our community. It's the way to go, it's the way forward to not entirely rely on turnkey solutions. It's also a way to globally improve the quality of remote interpreting. I also need feedback from remote interpreting moderators to give me tips and tricks so my interpreters can dedicate 100% of their abilities to interpreting and not bother at all with online management. As a remote interpreter, I suffered a great deal when I had to cope with technical aspects more often than not. Finally, I would need the Remote Simultaneous Interpreting Forum to gather all the knowledge available plus ongoing experimentation within the interpreting community. And believe me, there is a lot going on. Uh, the third question is how I see interpreting solutions and how I see the interpreting community adapting to the pandemic. Well, One minute, I, 38 well, seconds. All right, I need to rush. I can see a perfect opportunity for the interpreting community to raise awareness on the need to embrace uh, remote simultaneous interpreting. I talk to colleagues eager to learn and share discoveries with interpreting schools and professional associations. So in a nutshell, it's the perfect timing for us to dive into the unknown and not be afraid of the technical aspect of interpreting. So we need to know about the right USB headset, the best mic on the market, the right connectors and adapters required for modern laptops, poorly equipped with USB ports. The right laptop, of course, the best video conference web applications on the market, the, the tutorials that may exist or need to be created, the kind of HDMI monitors you need to actually see the floor when working from a distance. So this is the perfect timing for platforms and LSPs and independent conference interpreters like myself to put everything there is on the table and strike some win-win agreements because in the end we all need each other. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Cyril, thank you so much. So I think um, I really appreciate you bringing in the individual consultant interpreter uh, point of view because we have to look at how we can equip interpreters to be able to do this. People are rightly concerned about making sure they hold on to their clients. And um, so thank you for bringing all of that to the fore. You can go ahead now, Cyril, and uh, release the mic. And I'm going to uh, thank now, you. you bet. Oh, and you even finished before time. So thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to give the floor to Naomi Bowman. And I've got to get to my right button here. Naomi will be uh, showing up here in just a moment. Naomi is connecting from Brussels, Belgium. She is the uh, CEO and president of DS Interpretation. Naomi has had her eye on technology and remote interpreting for some time. She also runs a very successful uh, conference interpreting uh, business. She already let me know that she may have some problems in terms of uh, connectivity because of some additional usage that has to go on right now on her connection that is unavoidable. We're going to do our best and we're going to hope we can hear. Naomi, I am going to turn it over to you. You've got five minutes. You may want to double check and make sure your microphone is unmuted.
there we remote go. interpreting 101. Unmute your mic, but have a have a separate mute button. It's very helpful. Um, hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, I am Bill Wood's daughter and run our company, DS Interpretation, that he started back in 1972. I want it to be known first that I hate presenting remotely. I'm like the interpreters because I like to be able to connect to my audience and I can't see any of you. So that makes it challenging. But right now, this is all we've got. So I am going to do my best, my utmost to connect with you. Um, so this week I posted on LinkedIn that I was actually excited about the future. And that seems like a very strange thing to say, given the pandemic situation. But it, it's really genuine because I have spent the last couple of weeks working with clients, connecting with clients, and trying to solve their problems and get them back to work. And it's inspiring and it's exciting and there are opportunities and this is the reality that we live in right now. So I'm focused on that. Um, with respect to Barry's questions, he said, what do you need to ensure business continuity over the next three months? And I thought about that. For my company, I'm not focusing on what what I need or what my company needs. I'm focusing on what our clients need. And what they need is reassurance that they will have access to language services as they transition to a virtual world. We're in the conference um, interpreting sector, so every event has been canceled. Our, our sector has has basically been obliterated as we know it. And they need to know that somehow we can still provide these services to them. So focusing on what they need allows me to make a business-driven business um, response approach for them to the pandemic and inspires me and keeps me busy. So what resources are lacking for, for me to do this? Um, everybody's touched on this. Internet connections are of paramount importance and somewhat problematic. I'm installing a separate dedicated line even though I'm in lockdown here in Belgium. So that's one resource. Other than that, We've worked really hard to prepare our company over the years for market transition. And the, the main resource that we're actually lacking is interpreters who are willing, able, and ready to work remotely. So we need the interpreters and the practitioners to do everything they can to, get, to do this work. Okay? Um, and we need to work together and get the word out. That is absolutely important. All of us need to work together. How do I see the market, uh, how do I see interpreting adapting during the pandemic and afterwards? Number one, I don't view it as adapting. I view it as working. I'm focusing on let's get to work. I, I don't even think about it as, um, as adapting. What do we have to do to make this job happen? I view it as work, business decisions, a business-driven focus to serve our client needs. We exist to serve the market. The interpreters exist. The profession exists. The language market exists. The language services market exists to serve the market of our clients. They're what count. We have to, they're what counts, we have to respond to their needs. As the pandemic wanes, Barry's already mentioned it, this is going to take hold, this is going to be the future. We are going to see conventional approaches come back, but they're going to be augmented by more AI, more new tech solutions, more hybrid approaches, and this will help provide access to language services, which is what we're all here for. So meanwhile, um, right now we're in a little bit of a holding pa pattern as people ramp up. Everybody wants to get back to work. It's our job in the language industry to help our clients get back to work. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Naomi, so much for that. And I am going to move and give the floor to Virginia Vasquez Vaccaro. 
She is from Amnesty International, uh, one of the other end users of interpreting services that we thought would be a, a good person to hear from because they have international operations and have had to adapt. So, Virginia, if you can, oh, there you are. I will accept your request for the mic and just unmute your mic and your video. And the time is yours. Gracias, Barry. Voy a hablar en español. Eh, soy Virginia Vázquez Bacaro y soy coordinadora de interpretación en Amnistía Internacional. Antes de abordar algunas de las cuestiones que, que, nos, que, que nos traen hoy y las preguntas que Barry nos compartió, querría contarles un poco cómo funciona la interpretación en amnistía, porque creo que es un poco diferente a eh, lo que se cree de cómo funciona en lo que son las organizaciones internacionales o en general las ONGs internacionales. Escuchamos la experiencia de Rotary antes, me alegró eh, tener a unas eh, compañeras hoy, el caso es que eh, en Amnistía hay una unidad de interpretación dedicada, especializada, que es parte de un centro de lenguas, un, un centro especializado de profesionales de los idiomas. Eh, desde esta unidad de, de interpretación coordinamos todas las necesidades eh, de Amnistía Internacional a nivel global, pertenecemos a lo que es el Secretariado Internacional y no lo que son las entidades nacionales. Menciono esto porque tiene mucho que ver con, con nuestra operación y las, por ende las necesidades que tenemos eh, lingüísticas. Y trabajamos con eh, sesiones muy pequeñas, encuentros pequeños, hasta de repente nuestra asamblea global que dura durante eh, muchos, eh, muchos días. Un elemento fundamental de nuestro trabajo es que trabajamos con intérpretes ad honorem. Es una red de colaboradores eh, que nos apoyan y deciden donar sus habilidades eh, profesionales y su tiempo a amnistía porque creen en el trabajo que hace la organización. Y este es el elemento clave que cambia nuestro trabajo. Imagínense este contexto y eh, de repente necesidades específicas de una ONG que trabaja con activistas de los derechos humanos muy de base con las limitaciones de acceso a tecnología, recursos en general. Y fue así un poco como eh, comenzamos a trabajar con interpretación a distancia. Eh, veníamos, eh, lógicamente, como muchas de otras organizaciones, trabajando eh, con lo que sería la interpretación consecutiva, videoconferencias, etc pero a mediados de 2017 empezamos a trabajar con eh, interpretación simultánea a distancia. ¿no? El, el, la, la RSI que menciona, y que no tiene una sigla en español, por cierto, eh, que mencionó Barry antes cuando nos hablaba de las, dif de las diferentes modalidades. Eh, y esto es, fue esencial para garantizar esta inclusividad y esta diversidad que Barry también mencionaba antes en, en las reuniones, en los espacios democráticos de una organización como la nuestra, ¿no? que trabaja en derechos humanos. Empezamos haciendo reuniones piloto con eh, una plataforma. Hicimos dos minutos, unas, Virginia. Dos vale, minutos. Unas, pocas, unas pocas reuniones y luego ya esto, el año pasado, por ejemplo, representó el 40% de nuestra actividad, para que se den una idea. Y lo aplicamos en un modelo muy específico, que era lo que quiero compartir con ustedes, porque esto, demuestra, esto nos ha permitido a nosotros adaptarnos a la realidad de lo, a lo que nos ha enfrentado el, el coronavirus y esta pandemia. Todas nuestras reuniones y nuestros viajes se cancelaron, o sea que ahora eh, todas pasan a ser virtuales o se han pospuesto para fin de año, que es una realidad que como comunidad de interpretación también vamos a tener que enfrentar porque todo el trabajo se va a acumular a fin de año. Esa es una de los, eh, creo, las cosas a las que nos tendremos que adaptar también. Pero bueno, básicamente nuestro modelo es reuniones completamente online, como la que estamos teniendo hoy, eh, para que los intérpretes y las intérpretes estén en las mismas condiciones que el resto de los participantes, moderador, facilitadores, etc. Y nos permite a nosotras en el, en el, en el backend, digamos, en, en el fondo, aplicar los mismos estándares y procesos de interpretación de conferencias y lo único que cambia es la tecnología en sí. Y esto ha sido muy importante, lo venim, se los digo, venimos haciéndolo hace dos años, y es lo que nos va a permitir atravesar estos próximos meses, con desafíos, por supuesto, que muchos ya los han mencionado, el tema de la formación de los intérpretes, del acceso a la tecnología y a la interpretación, y sobre todo también, y es algo que, no, que, que creo que es importante para el, para el resto de, 
del sector, pensar en cómo trabajar con esos facilitadores, esos organizadores de estas reuniones online, que están acostumbrados a trabajar de manera presencial, facilitar de manera presencial, y cómo incorporar el elemento, el elemento online. Eh, ¿Cómo lo vemos eh, a futuro? Para mí lo más obvio es ver esta aceptación, por fin, del resto del sector y de la comunidad de la, de la interpretación, intérpretes y asociaciones profesionales, y estos últimos días hemos visto cosas concretas como el comunicado de AIC, o el hecho de que una organización como el Parlamento Europeo esté utilizando ya interpretación a distancia. Por ciento, Barry, con una de las plataformas que le faltaba un asterisco, creo, en tu lista, sí. y me quedé sin tiempo. Bueno, está bien. Este, Por favor, en el chat puedes poner el nombre de la plataforma. Como digo, hay tantas. Necesito sí. agregar eh, esa plataforma también. Uh, por favor, hazlo y muchas gracias. Y ahora vamos a pasar directamente a Brian Forrester. Y yo voy a cambiar al inglés. Y Virginia, muchísimas gracias. De nada, ya me desconecto. Okay, Brian, you are up. Brian Forrester is the CEO and founder of Boostlingo, which is a technology provider that is making it possible for LSPs and other entities to have access to the infrastructure necessary to be able to uh, in provide over-the-phone interpreting or just audio interpreting and then VRI interpreting. Brian, if you'll unmute your microphone, I think we'll be all set. Let's see, we're still not hearing you. We may want to check if you've got another spot for unmuting. There you go. You got it. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Barry. I'm going to do my best to go very fast here and cover um, a lot. So thanks again, Barry, for organizing this and, and pulling off this event and, and inviting Boostlingo to have an opportunity here. And I, I want to just say at the beginning, um, Fardad and Kudo, this is my first uh, time using the platform. I'm very impressed. Uh, I know, Fardad, I've sent you many referrals in the past, but it's very cool to see it firsthand. Um, I'm going to really quickly just, I have like two or three slides I'm going to go through very quickly. Uh, I think I know how to share my screen here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, so can everybody see my screen? Is this, is this working? I hope so. Um, so again, uh, yes, Brian, it's working. Okay, great. So um, just a little background again on Boostlingo. Our main focus is working with language service companies, uh, language agencies. 80% of our cu customers are in the United States. We do have many abroad as well. Uh, we are a white labeled technology platform that allows LSPs to do what we call internal call routing, route calls from their clients to their own interpreter pool. We also have our own network of interpreters, the Boostlingo Professional Interpreter Network, we call it the BPIN, which allows uh, LSPs, customers, to place calls on demand in over 200 languages 24-7, um, and we're doing you know, roughly around four to 5,000 calls a day through our platform. A big focus of, of, of what we do is video communication. Um, and everything is around consecutive interpreting. I know there's been some presenters here that are talking about simultaneous interpreting. Boostlingo really focuses on the consecutive interpreting for both phone, video, but also in-person interpreting. So it's been really interesting for us to see during this COVID-19 um, you know, uh, crisis what those, the stats are through our platform. Uh, just in the past two weeks, the inbound inquiries we're getting from our LSP clients have increased almost twofold, um, and it's almost more work than we can keep up with because a lot of our LSP customers are primarily focused on in-person interpreting. Well, that in-person interpreting has dropped off. What we're seeing is that about 60%, at least in the United States, of in-person interpreting has dropped off in the past two weeks. That is a significant drop off. Um, it's not completely unexpected here in the Bay Area. We are at sheltered at home. We're not even allowed to um, really go out besides maybe walking the dog uh, or going to the grocery store. And I think that's going to spread in more and more areas as these, this uh, virus becomes more pervasive. Um, for medical and healthcare calls through uh, our platform for OPI and VRI are, of course, increasing. We've seen about a 40% increase from things like urgent care, hospice care, um, you know, hospitals that are using the platform. But, you know, other sectors of OPI and VRI are dropping. If you imagine K through 12 uh, schools are all shutting down across the United States. That's a big chunk of what we do. Um, you know, government agencies. So it's been 
ups and downs for us in terms of the data that we're seeing. You know, um, uh, the biggest challenge for this time, what do we need for business continuity? The biggest question mark is how will LSPs be able to transition their on-site interpreting business to OPI and VRI? Because that's going to be critical to their survival. And, of course, by extension, that impacts Boost Lingo and how we weather the storm. So there's a lot of effort going into training our LSP partners. One minute 20. Brian. One minute 20. Okay, I'm going to go quick then. Um, you know, another big thing that hasn't been brought up yet is government assistance. You know, will these LSCs survive? Is there going to be a payroll tax cut? Any financial assistance? You know, there's a lot of talk out, out of Washington right now. We're very closely paying attention to... Um, you know, what kind of assistance that can uh, provide to our partners. And then a lot of interpreters, of course, need more remote work as they try to transition their job from field work to remote services. Um, our, re our biggest challenge right now is technical support and account management. We're struggling to keep up with all the inquiries, inbound requests. A lot of LSEs are reaching out to us and saying, hey, can you help us transition some of our clients to OPI and VRI? Um, and, and we think the outcome of all of this you know, we don't know when the end, end of the tunnel is going to occur. Part of it is the uncertainty. Is this a four-week event, a three-month event, a, an 18-month event? Um, but, you know, what is the light at the end of the tunnel? Um, and we think that there will be dramatic changes at the end. Even after this passes, we think a lot of the industry will move more remote. And the big question will be, how are LSCs prepared for that? And they've got to move quickly. Barry mentioned just how important uh, moving quickly will be. So that's sort of what we're seeing on our end and just a little data for, for the, the group here to absorb. I did it. I was that under five minutes. Was right, that was right on, man. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and Brian, thank you so much for being so generous with your internal data. Um, I think that those data points are going to be something of, of, of interest. And, you know, the reality is it's, it's often hard to find those kinds of hard numbers. So thank you for your generosity in doing so. Um, so um, you can go ahead. Perfect, Brian. What we've got to do now is we are at time, but for those of you who can stay on, um, please hang on for about another 10 minutes. And what we would like to do, we've got a couple other questions, and we're going to make use of the chat stream um, to have you answer these things. And we need to make sure that we can archive the chat stream um, so that we can collect this information. I've got a, uh, some questions that I would like to ask you, um, and Catherine, uh, if you want to go ahead and come back on, I can uh, get that request for you, and so we can do this at the same time. I'm going to have uh, Fardad also come up here again, um, and we've got three questions we'd like to ask and please use the the uh, messaging tab to be able to answer you will have to be concise or do multiple answers as this is a smaller messaging the, the messaging is for short messages so don't be too ver verbose um, the first question is what is the biggest obstacle keeping you from offering remote services right now and for all of those connected, the 100 and almost 40, um, feel free to just drop those into the participant chat stream. And uh, we want to see what those things are. Again, the question is, what is the biggest obstacle keeping you from offering remote interpreting services now? Give folks a little bit more time to answer those questions. Um, this is all going to be really helpful. Yeah, seems like we're already getting sort of four. We've got clients aren't ready. No problem. I am ready. <laughs> Don't understand the technology. And I suspect that probably someone there's also just a cost that's involved. Yeah, I did see a couple of regarding cost yeah. as well. And, and of course the technical requirements and actually just getting access to that IT uh, capability to get going, even if it's not a huge, you know, hugely complicated process. I think that's going to be a, a something that kind of blocks things up, but a log jam. All right, we're going to get through yeah. a couple more questions, and then we've got a couple of things that uh, Fardad's going to be sharing with us. Next question: What is the biggest obstacle keeping you from using remote interpreting services? This is for end users. 
if we've got some that are still on, what, what keeps you from actually saying, yes, we're going to do this? And I see our colleague Giovanna's answered cost, and I know that part of what she's dealing with is she, you know, is a, provides a lot of community interpreting services as an agency, and that is an area that where a lot of low, small businesses can get cost, you know, priced out of being. We lost your audio there, Catherine. Hopefully you'll come back in here in just a second. But I think that is correct that uh, people are being priced out of the market with some of the yeah. costs. That's correct. So yeah. we've got that question again. What is the biggest obstacle keeping you from using remote interpreting services? And the third question, what would be go. the best way to get the story out about remote interpreting services? And, and just to be clear, we have a one from Luis saying my polls are not working anymore. Luis, we're just asking people to put this directly into the messaging box, the chat box, if you look at the little messaging box to the right in your screen and open that, then obviously you have because you wrote the message. We just want the answer in the chat box. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. where we're making use of the chat stream. So this last question, what would be the best way to get the story out about remote interpreting services? Just what comes to your mind? Because that's what we've got to do. We need to get the story out yeah. as a profession and as an industry. What would be the best way to get the story out about remote interpreting services? Excellent. I see that many are, are still on. We've had a few that have had to drop off. I understand there's some busy schedules. So you can continue to answer the, the, those questions if you have other ideas. But at this time, I want to give the floor to Fardad from Kudo for a couple of minutes. And then with that, uh, after that, we will come back, wrap up, and say thank you. So Fardad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barry. I'm going to share my screen. This is, a, this is one of my friends. Uh, she's an artist. She uh, shared this uh, kind of a what the last few weeks uh, felt like. You know, life is good. Well, Corona, uh, not a big deal, right? And then it's becoming serious and pretty much everything got canceled. And we're happy we're still here. Now it's about, oh, we're all uh, together in this, right? And so what's the message out there is like, stay safe, but also stay digitally together. Um, uh, first, uh, I want to just uh, recognize uh, people who are actually making this communication enable for us. We have a, a, a great uh, team of interpreters supporting us today, and without all the pressure of, hey, you got two minutes, so we start speeding up uh, the, the, the presentation. They've been doing a fantastic job. Uh, in our French uh, booth, we have uh, Lily, based in Washington, D.C. We have Natalie, based in Buenos Aires. Spanish booth, we have Lara in New York, Orestes uh, in Ecuador. Orestes is also a Kudo certified partner uh, with, uh, with a setup as a hub. Uh, Russian, we have uh, Asiel out of The Hague, Netherlands, and we have Igor uh, out of San Francisco, California. In Portuguese booth, we have Larissa out of Brazil. Uh, Larissa is also a Kudo partner working out of a studio. Port uh, in Italian, we have the uh, uh, rock star pair, Lilia and Maria, uh, they're both in New York and uh, supporting us. So um, what I wanted to say is um, it's been a very strange feeling for me as a technology provider, uh, uh, seeing everything that is going on, but at the same time, I've never felt so proud about what I do and how impactful it is. Uh, and this goes back to this um, section that says stay digitally together. No matter what sector you present uh, today on this call, whether you're a language service provider, whether you're an interpreter, a technology provider, you're pretty much enabling people to stay together, connect together and communicate together. So whatever services we provide, it's most wanted today than ever before. Just the format has changed. Um, I want to just uh, share with you a quick graph of what is the typical technology adoption life cycle. And um, you have the early adopters, you have those who've been doing remote interpretation or web conferencing or decentralized meetings for a few years. You have uh, 
majority of the users that they want to make sure that everything is working fine. I want to see if others are using, I want to take less risk. And you have the late adopters. What's happening with the coronavirus effect is we're going to have a quick uh, window of people trying to adopt the technology quicker. And this um, really uh, reflects some challenges for us, whether we are an interpreter, language service company, or a technology provider, or an end user. Even our end user who are in the call, they're also service provider to their clients. So what uh, we are experiencing is that uh, we don't have time for four weeks of uh, user onboarding. That's a typical onboarding process for us to bring a client kudo ready for their interpretation team, for their organizer team, for their IT team. We've done this in some cases within 24 hours in the last three weeks. Um, the reality is that connectivity is going to become more and more of a problem uh, because uh, my uh, six-year-old daughter today was actually attending her class on iPad that I had to get her for the first time. I never wanted her to have an iPad, but now she's watching, uh, she's basically following her class remotely. Um, the other thing is, as somebody mentioned earlier in the chat box, it's really a university's education system, whether for interpreting schools, uh, we want to make sure they're also continue to have training. So what uh, our response has been in the last three, four weeks? Uh, we expanded our server significantly. We have about 400% increase in the number of meetings we host a, a day. Uh, we are reaching out and adding resources. We have four or five new people just this week joining Kudo and also reaching out to partners because what we need is really uh, being able to uh, respond as many people mentioned during this call, the onboarding is the challenge. How quickly we can respond and make sure that first experience of a multilingual meetings would be successful. We also introduced a new Kudo Solo Studio that is pretty much designed for interpreters working out of their home office. Um, we created an automatic test page for people to really get to test everything before joining a meeting. We also extended complementary access to 16 universities, part of the EMCI, the European Masters of Conference Interpreting, to be able to finish their classes uh, by uh, mid-May end of this semester. So getting them on board, getting the trainers on board, so that takes uh, a lot of onboarding as well. We also uh, pretty much offer complimentary two-month access for all of our subscribers for the month of March and April. And any meetings that is going to be hosted um, in the month of March and April will be providing 50% discount. This is a, a sign for us to give back uh, while we are, of course, seeing a huge increase in business, but we want to be there uh, while our partners need and we feel very impactful. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, special thanks to Alison and Barry and Catherine to organize. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much for allowing us to use the platform. And Catherine, if you want to request access, I'll let you right back in. And um, there we go. And we are now just going to wrap up. Again, thank you for staying on for an additional 15 minutes. Uh, we hope this information has proved useful, interesting, and also heartening because we need to stay positive. We're in this together, and that's one of the great things that has, I've seen come out of this, as Fardad pointed out. It's time for us to work to help everyone make this transition so that our profession can remain strong and come out of this hopefully even stronger and ready for all of the different ways that the world is communicating and is going to be communicating. And so to that end, I would like to just quickly share my, my uh, screen with you one last time, because obviously we had an hour and a half here, an hour and 40 minutes, an hour 45 minutes. Um, there's still so much more work that needs to be done. There's so much more information that needs to be communicated. There's so much more cooperation that needs to be organized. And to that end, um, we are very pleased to announce that um, a week from today, on March 26th, um, 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Daylight Time, 
8, a, 8 a.m. Pacific, and in Europe, I think that would end up being 4 o'clock. I'm not sure when the time change happens just yet. It could be at a different time if the time change happens in the next week. Um, we are going to be launching another collaborative effort online, and uh, it's called a unified response to ensuring access to interpreting services during the pandemic. Um, this is a huge issue, not just for conference interpreting. If we look beyond our own little garden wall, um, we will see that the services are desperately needed, as, as uh, Brian Forrester had mentioned, in healthcare. And how are these going to be provided with these new ways of doing things? Um, At-risk populations, particularly those who are immigrants, those who are refugees, um, how are they going to get services if there is not language access provided? There's so much to this. Um, Catherine, is there anything else you want to add? I would just say that you can register at interpretamerica.com and there's going to be a lot of information forthcoming in the coming days. So give, give us a couple hours to get the registration box fully up, um, but I, also just to say we're planning on about a two-hour event and it's free. You know, and we're working. We're going to be working hard and fast with as many entities and stakeholders as we possibly can to get speakers up and a, a you know, in, in a similar interactive form as we can to try and yeah, I would uh, more you know, get, get some kind of yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, um, and I, and also go sorry. ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just. Kidding. I just it's my fault. It's my. It's, I do struggle. I, I'm working off a of satellite internet because I live very rurally and I can't use my in-town place because we have people self-quarantined in my other alternate office. So um, just we welcome you. We're going to be working with speakers. We Our goal is to get some kind of working group formed out of this so that we can actually have some kind of unified, coherent response as a profession as a whole so that we can have some say in what's happening to us during this time. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your time, folks. It has been a honor and, uh, frankly, just a, a wonderful experience to be able to host this for you. And we hope it has been uh, yeah. very useful yeah. for everyone. And so with that, we will say thank you to our interpreters who have done an amazing job. And everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and stay in contact.